Well, hello everyone and welcome to this iteration of Studio Soup. Welcome to see you on this great Tuesday night and excited to see what you think of these amazing artists that you're gonna be speaking with tonight. Just a reminder, this is a conversation, not only between the artists and our hosts, but also between you and our artists. So we hope that you will put your questions in the Q&A area. Um, I will be jumping in and out with some questions from the audience. Um, and we look forward to hearing from everyone um, exactly what um, they're hoping to get out of tonight's uh, event through that Q&A section. Um, we have some wonderful artists here tonight. I think uh, it would not be, it would, I would be remiss if I didn't say a big thank you to Peggy Reavy and Judith Blonick for bringing this idea to us back in actually the end of 2019. We've been doing this right through the pandemic and, um, and this great event has morphed and changed. Tonight, you'll see only two artists. There's so much to talk about. And, um, and Peggy's on a little hiatus making some uh, amazing work of her own. So um, we are very lucky to have our very own Cecilia Coger, our Director of Exhibitions for Angels Gate Cultural Center with us tonight as our host. And um, a big thank you to everyone for joining us at Angels Gate Cultural Center, even on virtual. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Right now, though, I'd like to bring up um, our fantastic artists, uh, one of our studio artists, Dominique Moody and Narciso Martinez. If you would uh, start your video and unmute, jump in, I will take this time to run away. Um, <laughs> look forward to seeing you all later. Thank you, Amy. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being with us here tonight. I am Cecilia Coger. I'm the director of exhibitions for Angels Gate Cultural Center. As Amy mentioned, you can put your questions in the chat feature at the bottom, uh, specifically for Q&A. There's a little Q&A button. Um, just a reminder, we are uh, not live streaming this. However, we will be recording this meeting for educational and promotional purposes. And um, also, you can enable closed captioning. It is a setting at the bottom of your screen, or if you're on an iPad, it's under meeting settings. So I'd like to quickly start off with an acknowledgement. Angels Gate Cultural Center is located in San Pedro in the Port of Los Angeles region in California. We recognize that we live and work on the traditional and sacred lands of the Tongva, Kitsch, Ahachiman, and Chumash, and the many other indigenous groups who call these grounds home. We at Angels Gate Cultural Center honor and extend our gratitude to all of the original people still living in this region. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, Studio Soup is a quarterly series in which we interview contemporary artists about their process and their practice. And tonight we have Narciso Martinez and Dominic Moody joining us. Um, just a little quick mini bio about each of them. Uh, Narciso Martinez was born in Oaxaca, Mexico and came to the US when he was 20 years old and went on to earn a Bachelor of Fine Arts and later a Master of Fine Arts from CSU Long Beach. He has shown locally and internationally and is currently showing with Charlie James Gallery in Los Angeles and recently closed his solo show at the Museum of Latin American Art. I saw it and it was wonderful. And he is also the current uh, Freeze Impact Award winner. So congratulations, Narciso. Uh, Dominique was born in Germany in an African-American military family living abroad, returning to the US to Pennsylvania in 1960. Moody's pivotal work, a nomadic art dwelling called The Nomad, is a mobile artist in residence which which toured throughout Los Angeles in 2015 and went on the road to create several residency projects from 2016 to 2019. Dominique has shown at museums and galleries nationwide, including the California African American Museum and Craft Contemporary. Both artists are currently based in the greater Los Angeles, in the greater Los Angeles area. So thank you so much again to our artists and I'm going to start with a big picture question that will kind of give everyone an introduction uh, to your work. 
Um, both of you really make work that depicts your lived experience. And um, either of you can start, and I, I don't know if one of you wants to jump in, but I know that's kind of a big picture question, but tell us about how your work depicts your lived experience. And maybe I'll ask Dominique, yes. And you are muted, Dominique. Me. Okay, sorry. Hello, everyone. Um, my lived experience has really informed my work uh, as an assemblage artist and collage, collages, uh, because it's narrative. And the lived experience, um, both for myself, but also my extended family, has, has had such an incredible narrative life experience that I felt the need to uh, both articulate that and illustrate it uh, through the visual experience as well. Um, it was very important for me to, to do that. It's a way of me um, being able to tell stories that I felt were, were not really visible or heard. And um, that lived experience has shaped that and it continues uh, to do so. Um, so I'm not just looking at the past, but the present and even the future um, of, of what will continue to be my lived experience. Yeah, Dominique, something that's interesting about your work is that it feels like like a collection, like you've collected these moments in history, these moments in time that sort of um, kind of tell a visual story. And I feel like that was really present in, in the image that Annie just pulled up. Um, but yeah, do you feel like this uh, experience that I mentioned earlier of, of growing up in a different country and in Germany as part of a military family, how is that uh, reflected into your work. And we'll, we'll uh, also ask Narciso the opening question, but I kind of want to segue a little bit deeper. Yes, um, certainly it, it has. And I, I think having been born out of the country um, and yet having had parents who were from the U.S., uh, it, it did create a multi-layered kind of cultural experience mm -hmm. that I was trying to articulate early on. I came in at a young age, uh, but at, at an age enough to have had a understanding that I am in two different places um, and had this kind of multiple experience. And it wasn't always easy to have been informed by two different kind of language experiences as well and therefore trying to find a language that was more in keeping with my actual experience was really important. And to me, the only thing I found that truly encompassed the more universal language was the language of art and creativity. It mm -hmm. tended to go outside of the boundaries of more formalized language and therefore um, I was much more fluent in, in that area than I was in either uh, the, the language that I ended up being born into in that country, in Germany, and then the language of my, my family and parents, which was English. I didn't feel really uh, proficient in either one to get to uh, the stories of what I wanted to say, but art was that language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you certainly have developed your own visual language in your practice that's very uh, distinct, and I think we'll talk more about that later, uh, but Narciso, I'd also like to hear how your work quite literally depicts your lived 
experience. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you came to the United States when you were 20, when you were an adult. So you lived a totally different uh, culture. And then you came to the US and lived a totally different uh, culture. Um, there's still some overlap and blend, of course, because you came here with um, other people who also came here in terms of who you were with and surrounded with and, and these people you worked with. But tell us about quite literally how your how your uh, practice depicts your lived experience. Yes. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I I feel like the first uh, memories I have uh, from being in the fields is growing up in back in Oaxaca in Mexico, and um, I, I feel like when I started uh, working here in the fields, um, it wasn't it wasn't until like sort of like the middle of my my studies, my art studies, that I realized um, how different my experiences were in terms of me working in the fields back in Mexico and me working here. Uh, in Mexico, we worked in the fields. Um, well, the whole community is, I grew up in an agricultural community, so people would work in the fields to feed themselves. Um, people did not have like irrigation systems or like fancy um, uh, fancy chemicals to apply to the plant. So we were pretty much at the mercy of the season, of the rainy season. If it would rain, we would have good rain, we would have good crops. If not, then we would have to um, learn how to survive with little we could harvest. And here I learned that it's very, um, uh, we are pretty much bound by the uh, agribusiness or the corporations and capitalism. And, and it's all about money. Like we don't care if, if, that, if that fruit is like, if, if that fruit is thrown away only because it's like crooked or like smaller, you know, like we just toss them out to the trash. And, um, but to the cost of that is like all the cheap labor uh, that goes into it, all the people that work hard and, um, and are pretty much fairly treated. And I feel like that, that experience is what triggered me to actually bring um, the stories of farm workers into the art. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these farm workers are migrants who immigrate seasonally, correct? And, and then they go home or, or I'm sure some people stay here. I mean, both of you uh, talk about migration as a pretty core um, component in, in your work. And I wonder, Narciso, if, if you wanna speak a little bit more to that lifestyle that um, these people uh, uh, inhabit uh, by essentially migrating uh, within California, I assume following um, wherever the harvest is, correct? And, and how, what's that significance within your work? Yeah, it's very interesting. Like, I, I think I just want to mention like how people immigrate from different countries. So, you know, like as far as I know, like all Latin America, when I met people from El Salvador, Guatemala, you know, and Ecuador, and uh, uh, obviously Mexico, which is closer. And uh, and so they they migrate to the United States. And then when once they get to the United States, they I feel like they migrate within the, the United States to find jobs, right? And then um, going more like, um, more focus on the on the farm workers. I, I personally never did the migration, like because people start picking, uh, they kind of like follow the season uh, from like from um, the Coachella Valley to California to here in uh, Central Valley, and then they go up uh, to Oregon and then to uh, Washington and then Tacoma and then like they go all the way up to like I don't know how uh, honestly I don't know how how far up they go, but. Uh, I met a lot of people who do the migration and like, and uh, they will tell me all these um, situations and they, they have to go through, they, sometimes they will have to, leave, to sleep under the vent. When it rains, the water will go, go under it. So it, they will set up tents. Um, it, it, it was just like, it, it was just amazing. But uh, they, sometimes they have to leave their kids like um, in charge with somebody like, I don't know, teachers so that they can take care of them while they go further up and uh, and it's just crazy the, the the situations that these people have to go through and um i i personally uh follow i i personally follow different um 
routes within a city. Like it did work from different orchards in different cities, but I didn't, I didn't like spend the night like further away from, from my brother's home, which is where I lived when I was working in the fields. But, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I think, um, I think it's important to mention that migration is not natural. I think, I think like whether in animals, plants or humans, we, we just tend to go and, and find uh, better places to live. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because your work is, is a features people who follow these patterns of, of migration. And Dominique, you actually live patterns of migration in actually uh, this huge series of your work uh, called The Nomad. So I'm wondering if we can see an image of that and if you want to tell us about this nomad project. Yes, well, the, the, the nomad is in many ways um, the, the dwelling that you see here on wheels, which is a mobile artisan residency. It's kind of the culmination of decades and decades of creating work that led up to this. And this is only the most recent, but my work is primarily um, based in an assemblage um, co some often combining both collage and assemblage together um, and working in a three-dimensional form. Although I started out much more traditional and as a portrait artist. And I still apply those same elements um, to these larger works that I'm doing now. In the Nomad, I really don't have a studio. Um, and I had to make a choice between um, maintaining a, a studio, a dedicated workspace, or doing the nomad. And in the end, I chose to do the nomad. I feel that one of the most important components of creating art was the to have the space that actually inspires and nurtures me. And for me, that was a home. And while my family were not um, uh, moving and migrating to in an agricultural way, we were moving and migrating to seek out home. And uh, I think that the military life experience kind of um, engenders that pattern of people having to move about to go to different bases, to go to different states or different countries, but our pattern kept repeating itself even though once we returned, my father was no longer in the military. And part of that was the issues of, of race in the country during the 60s and 70s. It was even one of the reasons why um, my family left in the, in the 50s. Um, through the military, my father being an officer had the choice to take his family. And even though he was taking his family into a country that had um, been kind of torn apart by you know, the, the horrors of war, um, he actually felt that that would provide a better opportunity than what he was finding in America as a, a black man uh, mm -hmm. raising a family. Um, but I, I do feel I need to almost start uh, with them and my parents because by the time uh, before I was born, they had uh, decided to raise their family of five at that point in a trailer and travel across the country and through the South in 1952 in a new moon 45 foot trailer as home. And that was really rare and unusual at the time. Um, nomadic living has never been embraced in the US. Uh, it, it is frowned upon, it's, it's often seen as negative. Um, like migration, there are seasonal patterns of, you know, based, particularly within more uh, indigenous groups, 
those seasonal patterns. And so when applied to more contemporary patterns of movement, it's seen as very um, negative, as kind of vagrancy, as being unrooted. And yet that is not, that was not our experience for ourselves to feel that way. Um, however, we did want to feel like we could find a place that we could actually call home, that we could afford, that we would be accepted as a, a black family within a community. And that was very hard to find and it never quite happened during my childhood. Mm -hmm. And so I continued the pattern as well. And by the time I was ready to build the nomad, I had moved 46 times at that point wow. in my 50 some years. And that pattern alone suggested to me that something else was happening, something else was needed. And so a home on wheels made sense. Wow. Th thank you for sharing that. And, and this is why I was so excited to bring both of you together um, in this conversation is because I think this is such a core component of, of what embodies both of you and, and, and your practice is this uh, topic of a nomadic lifestyle of, my, of migration, of people moving in it. And it sounds like for both of you, it, it was almost an attempt to find a solution, right? To find, a, for uh, Dominique, for, for your family, to find a place of, of acceptance, to find a place that could be home. And then for Narciso, for um, migrant uh, workers to find income and, and to find opportunity. And because, as you mentioned, migration isn't something that is uh, highly valued in, in U.S. society and our value system, it presents a lot of challenges. Um, I, I'm curious, Narciso, about maybe some of the challenges uh, that some of your subjects um, have faced in, in their lives as, as part of this need to work in the fields, to travel throughout, you know, Central Valley, and how does that come across in your work? Well, um, well, definitely, uh, it's already a challenge to be a farm worker. It's already difficult, like, when it comes to, like, um, I don't know, um, wages, when it comes to, like, working condition, it's already a challenge. Uh, um, it's it's difficult already to not many times not speak the language that language barrier between you know the people who own the orchards and the workers and um, sometimes we don't know our rights and uh, we just let people or we just don't question um, the situations in which we encounter ourselves in the fields. Um, we I feel like we protect ourselves as much as possible by using all kinds of uh, like bandanas and hoodies and, but I feel like it's not, um, it's not enough. I think like, I feel like whenever we need to make an extra buck, we just don't care about it because our job is seasonal and, um, and we have to make the most out of it. And there are, there are um, periods of time where there's no work. So they have to, they have to like, save as much as possible, make as much money as possible during the picking season. So, so they pretty much expose themselves to all the uh, dangers, I guess, from, from the fields like pesticides and, and, the, um, and many times the, the branches that could poke your eyes. And, and, but I feel like the challenge is like over time, I feel like, I feel like, I don't know if people are studying this, but like, I feel like all these, um, all these, I don't know, chemical residues on the fields. Like, I don't know, I, f I feel like they should, I mean, I don't know how to put this because I, I actually have, I actually talk to people that I still don't know, that I still know from the fields. And, and there is a pattern of people like getting sick, getting sick or like uh, having, uh, let's say for women having so many um, premature uh, uh, birds and, uh, 
I feel like the last thing we spoke about one of my ex coworkers was the eyes. A lot of the people have grown. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Cataracts. I don't know what it is in English, mm -hmm. but there is something that grows on the eye. And in in that whole small town where I used to live, there is so many people with that problem. And um, and it, it, at this point, it's just um, supposition, right? We we just think that it's because of the chemicals that that are in the fields, but nobody knows for sure because I don't know if nobody's doing any kind of studies. And um, and the, and we think that way is because our own experiences, right? How how when an orchard is spraying on one block and we're not supposed to work on, on that block or next to that block, but only because it's um, the assigned block to work on, we'll have to work on that block. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's like there is no organization. I guess there's no uh, consciousness from the part of the managers, I guess, to to not put the the workers at risk. But those, I feel like those are the, the some of the challenges that are that are um, that I remember and that's still prominent uh, according to my coworkers. And um, um, so yeah, I don't I don't know like in terms of. Uh, in terms of my, my, migrating from one place to another in, in order to come to the US to work, uh, many, many of the workers sometimes don't, cannot make it because they, they don't have documents, so they can't come like uh, legally. So a lot of the workers come from, different, from other parts and sometimes they, they cannot make it to, to the United States and sadly they, they get lost, they died on uh, trying to cross the border. There is this program called H2A, which brings, um, uh, hire workers from other countries and it seems like so ideal right like we we come with a with a secure job and like and they pay they paid our um, plane tickets but um but I feel like they 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 leave I actually met some people when I was working in the field and I remember like this person was faking he was sick because he didn't want to he needed a day of rest like they have to work like every day like more than eight hours and they cannot go anywhere because they don't know the city they don't have a car um it's like they they live in, in a prison and like when they go out shopping for groceries they have to go as a group it's just messed up i don't know it's just like it's like it's it's crazy it's crazy well i i really appreciate um you know your work and i and i think the reason why your your work is getting so much positive well-deserved attention is because you're asking us to value um, the people who are unseen and, and who go through these challenges that you mentioned. I love the piece Legal Tender that Annie showed, um, the large piece that you had at uh, MOLA because you actually place workers on a dollar bill directly making that parallel between you know valuing um the farm workers who work so hard to provide us the food that we eat every day um i really love this piece um so i i really really think that you're bringing so much attention um to the lives of of these people who whose lives are so much more difficult than than mm -hmm. some of so, so I, I really appreciate um, your practice. And I, and I know, Dominique, that you also um, have some really um, challenging parts to, to making your own practice as a visual artist, something that I, I can't even imagine having to deal with. And I'm wondering if we can pull up the piece, uh, Myopic Vision. Um, and maybe you can tell us about your unique challenge as an artist. Yes. Um, you know, as you as you go about through, again, your your lived experience, sometimes you'll encounter uh, challenges within your life that you're certainly not prepared for. And they they are very personal. But I have begun to find that Oftentimes the personal um, really pushes you to express things in a much more universal way. And the shift in my eyesight was one of those experiences for me. Um, while it was a real challenge and struggle uh, personally, <clears throat> and the biggest challenge of it was 
was not actually the um, the condition itself, which was that I was losing my central sight, and in in that deterioration of my central sight in my late twenties, I was already a struggling but practicing artist, and um, my work was very detailed. Um, I was much more attracted to realism and drawing and, and uh, starting painting. Um, and, and so I had a lot of formal training, a lot of traditional work. So to lose that kind of sight was a, a, a traumatic experience. And what I uh, felt I, I needed to do was, was to mm -hmm. kind of go inward um, it's a real social stigma to have what is deemed a disability. And as a person who was already layered with a complex life, um, being a black woman, um, being a, a black woman at the time when this was occurring um, was just after I had gone through a period of becoming a um, undocumented person due to a quirk in the system that brought me in through a military family without doing some of the proper um, uh, citizenship uh, demands. And so I've had all of these experience and now I was then struggling with my sight. In this photo, the way I work, which is sometimes at various scales, depending on what I find, the objects and found material can be very small or very large. And in many ways, I kind of harvest the dumpsters, uh, which can be really um, strange work to do and to it sometimes even dangerous. But in finding those materials and then having to explore them visually and put them together and assemble them into sculptural pieces requires magnification. Uh, glasses don't really affect my eyesight. And these are the traditional glasses. The glasses you see me wearing in this photo are magnification glasses. So it's not the kind of glass you can walk around in. And so without the magnification, I am deemed to be partially sighted or partially blind. And when I first heard that term, I was really shocked and I was very disturbed by the use of it because I felt that there were things I could still see and a world that I could still uh, be within that was visual, uh, but blindness is a spectrum and it has all kinds of nuances of what it is you can see. What I have very big difficulty is reading print. So in myopic vision, if we go back to that one or this one here, is those little beads have word and letters on them and I was making them into words and in order to even see those letters, I have to use magnification. Um, so, you know, I cannot recognize faces. Um, I can kind of see people more as silhouettes. And so that's what started to play into the artwork. I really wanted people to kind of see the way I was seeing. And I was actually beginning to feel that I was seeing a world that was invisible um, to the, the normal eye. And I was going both inwards into my own personal life, memory and dreams, because that's where my vision was completely clear. Um, in myopic vision, that's a self-portrait and it combines both text and a poem that I wrote using all the kind of uh, word isms regarding sight in the English language. And the magnification are from tools I used to use until they were no longer strong enough uh, to really assist me. 
And it's this use of that portrait being on wheels that regardless of whether I had this limitation, I was going to be mobile. I was going to be able to move through the world in my own way. And that was really important for me to continue practicing um, being visually creative, even though for many, it became a real contradiction that I was a visual artist with a visual impairment. But what it did teach me is that there was a big difference between sight and vision. And what we all know as creatives is that artists have vision. That is not deterred by a condition. You still have the vision. And the tool is sight. And there are all kinds of other tools to use. And so that is the shape of how my work truly began. I believe my work is stronger for it. Mm -hmm. Dominique, I'm going to jump in here. Um, what uh, an interesting place to segue to some questions from, from the audience. I'm going to remind the attendees that if you have questions, please put them in the q and I'd be happy to jump in here a couple more times tonight. But I did have a question. I actually have one for each of you, but I'll start with Dominique because I think it's an interesting segue. Because of um, those opportunities that you have with looking at things differently, do you find that materials ever inspire a piece? I know you and I have talked about your found objects before. Can you talk a little bit about maybe how materials inspire pieces for you? And then I'll jump yeah. back in with for Narcissa. In, in a piece, a very large installation, like a family treasure found, it's a very large set of portraits of my family, but it started out with a single, very, very small photograph. And although in, in, this photo, in, in the photograph of this work, my mother's portrait, which is in, in the centerpiece, and there's a ceramic um, kind of bowl that she is holding, a, an object from a thrift store or, or garage sale. Um, and Inside of that container is a photograph that was um, basically a, a passport photo. And as we were coming back to the States, uh, you usually take two passport photos and she sent one back to the family to show how the family had grown. And the original passport got lost over the many moves. But in my forties, and as uh, when my um, grandmother passed away, we were allowed to kind of look into the boxes of her treasured photos. And at the very bottom of the box under a flap was found the second passport photo. Now, this is almost 40 years after the fact. And, and it was um, a really amazing to see that tiny uh, photograph. Another piece that started with a single object was Soul Soul Shine. And that is a piece that waiting for a bus in, in Los Angeles, I was sitting at the bus stop uh, waiting at, on Pico Avenue. And in the gutter was a complete formed shoe sole with no shoe connected to it. And I was astonished by seeing it. And the first thing that came to mind uh, was, you know, the, you know, this line, someone in LA has lost their soul. And I felt that the double meaning of that and the whole idea behind, you know, you have to kind of try to walk in somebody else's shoes um, was such a profound statement that I felt the object needed to be kept and brought into being into something else. Uh, the people who were watching me uh, pick up this shoe sole though were in complete disgust. They thought I was perhaps crazy. And I got on the bus and, and no one wanted to sit next to me. But in the end, it became a focal point in an exhibition where people really were attracted to that piece and very compelled by it. And I felt that the story 
that I gave the object pulled it into a, a, a whole different kind of meaning. And I think that the power of creativity to do that is astonishing. Thank you so much, Dominique. Um, and Narciso, um, I think one of your pieces, um, the tree of life really, I think trees are grounding and growth all at the same time. And um, I wonder, uh, the question here is, can you talk about your impetus or your research and process of this piece? When I, when I saw this in person at that opening, I, I was so wonderfully surprised to see your work changing, but also um, holding true. So maybe you could share about that. Well, I, I, I think it all, I, I feel like I always try, I always try to include or challenge myself by trying something different every time. And um, I remember I really wanted to do a big tree out of boxes, but um, but when the moment came to do, when, when I had the opportunity, because I, I thought about this when I didn't have a studio space. And when the moment came and someone um, invited me to use one of the walls of her gallery, I was excited about it, but I didn't have enough boxes to build a tree. and and. And then I, but I really, the idea of showing a tree was really within me. And I was like, I got to do a tree. How do I do a tree? And um, well, I happen to have these uh, berry packages uh, on, my, on my wall uh, because I wanted to show actual photographs uh, of the farm workers. And I thought I could use these uh, packages as frames. So I only had them like two or three on my wall, just sort of like, I don't know, just brain, brainstorming for a project, for a different project. And then I remember um, I, I remember my niece's uh, silhouette uh, portrait that she did when she was in in I don't know in first grade or second grade or maybe it was kindergarten I don't know, but I I just I just in my head I, I thought how elegant it was how beautiful it was um, and simple uh, mm -hmm. just by cutting out an image and then frame it and it was just beautiful and of course I learned about Kara Walker mm -hmm. and um, William Kenridge and uh, and all these just came together and I was like, I think I'm gonna do a huge tree uh, silhouetted and then I will I will um, I will show these packages as the fruit, right the products of those trees. And then um, so I try to I try to do the the shadows and the and the leaves and the branches with the black silhouetted, uh Parts and and the and the and the fruits or the product was uh, represented by these boxes. But then, what was the connection with the farm workers? So I introduced the photographs in these packages, and uh, and I still wanted to include like a, a farm worker. So it's you you can see the farm worker all the way at the top of the ladder. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's sort of like how the the tree of life was. Um, <laughs> And I guess I can share a little bit more about the title. Uh, I don't know. I feel like, um, well, this is, I, I guess I better not mention, because it has to do with religion, but the tree of life has uh, has a religion connotation. And um, and I don't know, I just kind of wanted to play a, a double meaning or maybe a subversion with the tree of life. And, um, and, and, and so how difficult it is for some people um, to, to make a living, no? And uh, and and so that tree of life. Um, wh what does it take for that tree of life to sustain all these all these other people? No, the workers. So that's that's how I titled the tree of life. And RC, so I had a follow up question. I'm glad someone asked you about uh, your use of materials because I feel like you're becoming pretty iconic for the way that you use produce boxes. And you, you said something earlier about your choice of using the plastic cases, how it was a, like a simple choice. And to use the produce boxes also seems so simple, but it's also so interesting. And I'm and I feel like that's your signature material, or at least what I think of as your signature material. Did you have a, a sudden aha moment or like, how did you make that first decision to make this what started as, you know, an iconic body of work? Um, how did you come to that decision? 
Well, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I've spoken a, a, about, a lot about these, but um, as far as I can remember, I, I think I have always, not always, but like for a long time before I started doing drawings on, on produce cardboard boxes, I did work on cardboard. I feel like um, the first time I used cardboard was in undergrad. Like uh, my painting professor wanted us to do a bunch of studies. And, uh, and I didn't have money to buy canvases or panels because that's what the, everybody, most of us would use panels. And uh, so I decided to do, uh, to cut a lot of cardboard pieces and then clear uh, regular chest uh, And then I do the studies on those uh, pieces of cardboard. And then I would, um, so that was that. And then at one point I went to see a show where Dominic Cretara, another painter professor at Casa Long Beach was, was showing. And I saw one of his paintings on cardboard um, I think I fell in love with the tan tone of the cardboard and how that contrasted with the colors um, that the artists uh, painted around it. And as soon as I graduated in 2012 from undergrad, I went to live with my brother for like a week or so. And um, and he had just purchased a mattress. So I I really liked the cardboard that the mattress came in. So I, <laughs> I got it and I put it on the wall. And I and I drew um, that was uh, I sh that was also my first kind of large drawing. I did a drawing of a uh, farm worker. I remember, um, and uh, I think at that point I was thinking religion because I, I tried to mimic like um, a cross and I and someone being crucified. But um, I think I don't, I don't know. I think um, to me it was not like. Um, to me, it was just like a little sketch or something that I could never finish. And so my professor invited me to do a show after I graduated uh, Casa Long Beach. And um, I showed some piece, some paintings and we, we were missing one work, one piece of artwork. Uh, it was like a group show. And then I, I mentioned this sketch that I had done on the cardboard and I brought it to the show. And I obviously I showed a photograph and, and I brought it to the show and they really liked it. My professor liked it. and. Uh, we even had a picture by the drawing. And I feel like that moment, it kind of legitimized drawing on cardboard. You know, I feel like, oh, okay, oh, it is it is something that can happen. And uh, and that was that, that was undergrad. And then I went back to the fields. I worked for three more years. And I came back to, uh, I, okay, I came back to the graduate program in 2018 at the same school, Castell Long Beach. And then I painted for like the first, maybe first semester, maybe a little bit more than that first semester, first semester I did uh, oil paintings. And, um, and it was sort of frustrating to, the critiques were very technical. It, it, it would um, address, uh, the critique, critiques would address like technicality mostly. Like uh, it would question whether I was a good painter or a bad painter or whether pro the proportions were off from the figures. And so at one point I just, um, I just got frustrated and stopped painting. And, um, and this is the way I remember. I think I stopped painting, the semester was over and then winter break came. And because I had done studies on cardboard when I was working in Washington State, uh, I would use my sister's garage and I would use the boxes that she would bring from Costco. Of course, I, it didn't occur to me to include the labels. I just I would just cut out like all the edges of the box and I would just draw on the center. And I did a bunch of those. And then during that winter break, I just went to do something that would make me feel like I would still be interested in doing something. So there was this moment where I went to help my brother again in Hollywood. No, actually somewhere in, yeah, somewhere in LA. And uh, he sent me to get pizza Costco. And then I saw this, box that I liked and I was like oh I'm gonna take this box maybe I can draw on it so I took it it landed in my studio at Kelsey Long Beach and I did this drawing because it was a banana box I did this banana man uh, a man carrying a bunch of bananas and I started drawing it on the center but I don't know what I was thinking honestly I don't remember but I didn't cut the edges yet maybe I was thinking I'll cut it later I don't know but I don't know I feel like I didn't I didn't think this I think I didn't think it through, right? Like this, the proportion of the main was a little large, so it couldn't fit in the in the little center. So it kind of bled a little into the edges. And uh, and when the next semester approached, I showed that to my class, and um, and they liked it. My professors liked it, and uh, the fact that we were not talking about technicality as much anymore, I think that made me happy. And the fact that 
we started talking about the things that I wanted to talk like the farm workers who was a farm worker why is he carrying a banana like who's this man do you know these men all these little things sort of like um got together and and I, I not only learned that that was a good way to represent stories of farm workers and contrast those uh with the agribusiness through the labels but also I understood that um that I that I needed to bring people that I knew to the stories because at this point it was a banana. I never been to a banana plantation, so I didn't know this person of these men, um, and I couldn't say much except for like that's probably a hard work. But I also work in the field, so I know how difficult it is to carry these things. So that's how um, I started bringing more and more people that I that actually that actually know that actually met that actually interacted with into the art. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I love hearing that story. It sounds like it was born out of necessity and then it <laughs> sort of became something that made a whole lot of sense for your work. Um, just a reminder to everyone, you can put questions in uh, in the chat. We might not be able to get to all of them, uh, but I'm sorry, through the Q&A feature, you can ask uh, some more questions and we'll get to them as we can. Um, you know, something really interesting about your work, Narciso, is that uh, you uh, tackle the figure in a very, a very direct, matter-of-fact way. And I actually feel like for Dominique that your work is quite the opposite in the way that you tackle the figure. It is not so immediate and direct. Um, uh, we saw earlier your piece, I believe, uh, I know we brought it up a few times, but I feel like it was the best example um, I feel like it was a family, a family treasure found, treasure found. Um, you kind of, uh, tackle the figure in a different way, uh, where you show the absence of, of the figure. And I, and, and our earlier conversation that you and I had, I thought that that was so interesting and, and so meaningful. So I, I kind of like to give everyone a little bit of that conversation that you and I had, because I thought it was just so interesting uh, about this piece in particular. Yes, and th this part installation was very large. Um, it was to actually recreate a, a family portrait, um, bringing everyone, back in uh, to a kind of single uh, uh, experience. My family was very spread apart and some members of the family had been absent uh, to the nuclear family for some time period. Uh, and trying to make sense of that story and bring it together and create a narrative that was certainly my personal one, but something that a, a, a lot of families experience uh, in, in, in the US, this kind of disconnect of family members. And so I wanted to use things both that would unite these portrait figures, but also make them uniquely their own. And and also create visuals about the narrative of how I came about finding them, the journey that I went on. So if you bring that image back up again, on the far left is my father's portrait. And in that portrait, uh, his figure is actually cut out of the wood. The wood in this in all three of these pieces is uh, Douglas fir. And it is Douglas fir from a single tree. And that was kind of before reclaim wood was easily accessible. Um, but this, I was able to go direct to a mill and get a single piece that I could, then could cut into these components because I wanted to show the relatedness but in doing that, each figure is done quite differently. My father shows absence. His figure is cut out because during the process of going to see family members and tracing their, their shadows, his silhouettes, I was not able to find him in time for this portrait. But out of memory and photographs, I was able to capture 
his silhouette. I had been doing silhouettes from the late 80s. As soon as my eyesight was shifting, I saw the figure in that way. And so tracing the shadows, like Narciso was saying, the simplicity and beauty of uh, the, sh the, the shadow is quite amazing. And what I love about it too, is it requires in many ways, at times the participation of the subject to actually stand there and have their shadow trace. And it feels very mm -hmm. personal because mm -hmm. you are literally tracing their shadow. Uh, the second image of my mother in the middle, it's called Mother Home. And Mother Home, she is cut out of the wood and the base of her body is the table. And, uh, you know, the relationship she had is, um, you know, the mother of the household, the mother of a total of nine children, uh, really felt uh, like a, a, a perfect melding of, of objects, found objects and materials and her silhouette. And then the third figure on the right, uh, which is a self-portrait, is the wild child. So from my father's expatriate heart, then mother home, then wild child. And wild child, child was kind of a reference to my family nickname in which many of my siblings felt I had this kind of creative free spirit um, about me uh, from early childhood and that I expressed that. And then that is what you know, most of my life and personality was about. And when I started losing my sight, one of the things I felt was important was to, in many ways, return to the spirit of that wild child to get through these challenges. And this silhouette is both absent, not because um, I wasn't present, but because the core of who I am was more about the refigured mannequin, which to me is a dimensional silhouette. Um, mm. And so you get these three different forms of silhouette <clears throat> uh, created into one piece. I think I have loved doing silhouettes for a long time for the same reason that Narciso mentioned, um, doing in his work, there is something just so special it's specific, but also universal. Mm. Yes, oh, I just, I love that piece and I feel it's so layered and nuanced. And unfortunately, we're not there with the work in person, uh, but maybe we'll have a chance to see it in person in, in the near future. Um, something, you know, big picture, uh, well, two big picture points is sort of, I'm thinking about your, your hopefulness uh, like for the future and, and um, maybe what kind of glimmers of hope or, or inspiration. And I know Narciso, something that you've mentioned to me is, is how much you value education. And I'm not sure if we have um, an example that speaks to it directly, but I know that that's something that you also, you include the symbol of the graduation cap in, in your work and, and some of those elements. So what in your practice or your work maybe communicates that hopefulness uh, for the future? And maybe I just answered it directly for you, Narcisa. <laughs> but um, I'd like to hear uh, about that and, and how you incorporate that in your work. Yeah, no, like a legal alternative has a, a graduation cap on at the very top in the center. Um, I, I think, um, I think the more recent works that I've been doing, the ones that, that I, the last pieces that I um, finished um, lately, not only include like the same symbol, the graduation cap, but also includes like um, images of, of young children. Like, like I literally want to suggest that the next generations are gonna do better by, through education. I feel like, um, I feel like because I work in the fields and I know how hard it is, and um, and now that I'm in a privileged position, 
Uh, and I say privilege because it's so wonderful to have my, <laughs> sorry, it's so wonderful to have my produce delivered to my house and and uh, all organic and like fresh or whatever, you know, and I don't, I don't know if, uh, I, I don't even, I didn't even know about it when I was working in the fields, but like the idea that how, how all these people can do the same, how can we achieve the same count? How, how can, can it be a little bit more fair, right? How can we um, also enjoy those privileges? So for me, it was through education and, and um, and that's why I I sort of like suggest uh, um, and not only suggest when I'm like with my coworkers I literally tell them go to school you know like go to school learn English or you know and um, there's so many like uh, excuses right like I'm too tired or like I don't know uh, but I do suggest that their kids go to school because I think it's important for us to better ourselves. Mm -hmm. And also just to note, you um, also um, had your aha moment at grad school. And I went to the same school. I just want to point that out. That's I'm proud that you're from the same school as me. Um, and, and I think that that is uh, kind of a nice little moment uh, to point out that going to school and being able to have that educational opportunity, one thing led to another. And now you're just taking off, and and that's uh, a lot of that. All that's all you, but also owed to to education as well. And and Dominique, I you know I have a similar question for you, but maybe sort of what do you want viewers to sort of take away, or or what is it your hopefulness in terms of how your audience interacts with your work? And, and your practice? You know, the celebration of, of stories um, and not just my own, but of uh, individuals. Everyone has a story. Um, in an even larger picture, everything has a story. And so the objects I find have stories to tell. Uh, but one of the, the things connected to education is um, I see education coming in many different forms. <clears throat> and one of the most extraordinary life lessons uh, that, that I have had in the process of creating work that led to the Nomad is um, my family found uh, our ancestral line uh, through DNA. And in that moment that we found that information out, I was in the midst of completing the nomad. And so I had already named it. It already had its license plate. I had been using the term for years. Um, I knew I needed to move about, but create my own home that would accommodate that and take me with it. And so when the envelope was opened and my sister revealed that we were uh, just this almost 100% related to um, the West African uh, large tribal uh, communities of, that were nomadic of the Fulani and Hausa, I was in many ways not surprised, uh, I think what is amazing is that we have now also been able to date our family in terms of documentation almost to the mid 1800s, uh, 1700s even. And to think that we have been here in this country for that long a period of time historically and yet not necessarily been able to express our nomadic tendencies until now uh, tells me a whole lot about the, the ability to retain culture and ideas and ways of life in ways that we could only dream of. Um, and so for me to have been able to reconcile uh, with this way of having to be uh, displaced or moving about or um, as my father put uh, he wanted us to 
um, be at home in the world. Uh, it, it kind of brought that together for me in, in a very positive way. And it's one of the reasons why I realized that the, the nomad can offer solutions and hope and inspiration uh, to people who are also struggling with finding ways to be at home in the world these days. Wow, that was wonderful, Dominique. Um, I do have a couple more questions and I'm just amazing that we've now run almost to about, we have about 15 or 20 minutes left here. Um, but a comment uh, for Narciso, um, you know, somebody wrote immigrants doing unwanted but essential work are in many or most cases dehumanized and being treated as disposable tools. Um, they appreciate your work direct and the direct connection between art materials and subject that is portrayed on it. The viewer doesn't have much choice besides acknowledging existence and the work of people who pick the fruits and veggies for us. So that was a comment that was shared. But I think the other question that goes along with that is um, another viewer is wondering if you've had other farm workers reach out to you expressing their inspiration uh, when viewing or uh, when viewing your work. Is it, it is so universal that we they imagine that you've you've heard from them? But can you share any of those comments you've heard from from others in your field? Uh, of course, no. There there's many. There's many. I can't even tell how happy makes me that um, all these sacrifices, you know, like from going to schools and then to going to graduate schools and working in the fields uh, and meeting all these people in order for the work to be out there in the world um, makes me because uh, when people write the messages saying like they reminded of their grandparents or my parents work, still work in the field. So like I remember when I was a kid and my parents would come from home really tired. Like, you know, like all these uh, stories makes me feel like all these sacrifices were worth it. Um, I don't know. I, I think uh, I have I have actually done a project up in, in Fresno where the majority of the gallery attendees, I guess, were, were uh, descendant of farm workers or farm workers themselves. And like, we just met a lot of people that, were happy to see themselves like in art and that uh, they were inspired and and uh, moms taking their kids and like like telling them like hey, mijo look like you know you, this can be you and uh, it, it's just amazing it makes me happy um of course there's a lot a lot of there still a lot of work to do but I, I think uh the fact that um the fact that I'm doing something to uh, spark some kind of inspiration. Uh, I feel like growing up, I didn't have role models. And and if people are seeing this, I, I hope they get like, not only like if people are seeing these, like people who are farm workers or related to farm workers, I hope they can see that they are being watched, like even like, you know, not only like visual art, but writing and film. And I hope they can get that, can understand that what they do is important, that, uh, that they are important. And, and if people who are not farm workers, at least they can um, see that these people exist and that what they do is important. Thank you so much. And um, just a reminder, we have only time for a few more questions. So if you have one or a comment that you want us to share with the artists afterwards, please do go ahead and put those in the q and I'm curious, um, and, and this is a, a question for both of you, if the conversation tonight has maybe sparked some new connections or new uh, inspirations, I'm always curious, artists inspire one another and, and, and we borrow or, or we reinterpret um, the practice of, of others. So I'm just, just curious if, if any of you have maybe come to that sort of uh, conclusion or or anything like that tonight would be kind of interesting to hear. Well, it was, I, I feel like it was a, a reminder. I think the Nomad uh, project, uh, I, 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 when I was in school, I learned about the uh, Teatro Campesino. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but like it was a theater that would move from orchard to orchard, mm -hmm. showing like a play to farm workers. So at one point I thought I, I could do something like that with art just set up a gallery and show art, going to orchard to orchard and just show work and to the people who just like get out of work and like see quick, very quickly what's up. 
So I, it just reminded me of like, oh, I, I forgot about this project though. It's like in my to-do <laughs> list, but like, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I don't know. It's, I, uh, I think it's, your idea is wonderful. I, I love that idea of sharing with people who are not like, um, who are not really like, who cannot easily access art or like a space to work. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. Yeah. Well, Narciso, I, I love that idea. Um, and it, to me, the idea that you can uh, um, take work out to people instead of people having to come to the work, which is already a boundary and a barrier uh, for many, um, is, is such a wonderful concept. And I think there, the, the the mobility of bringing people in is so in, in important. And so whatever ways that that can still happen, I, I think it's wonderful. And it's maybe even something that I love collaboration. Um, you know, the idea of, of working with another artist such as yourself would be amazing. And for me, one of the things, your love of using cardboard um, I have used cardboard in quite a few of my pieces. Uh, a piece like um, Sweat Equity, I used uh, cardboard for the roof. Um, mm -hmm. and, but I pulled the cardboard apart. So the inner core of the cardboard is cargated and mm -hmm. the texture of it is, is really interesting and, and fascinating. And I was actually using cardboard mm -hmm. boxes That's really cool. from moving and especially moving some of my art art materials and old work and old sketches and drawings um, sometimes those boxes would be 20 30 even 40 years old and when they finally um, kind of deteriorated to the point where I had to replace them I would then use that cardboard in the artwork um, another very consistent material that you just saw in sweat equity are bottles. And there's something absolutely amazing for me about bottles and the glass. And once the labels are removed and scraped off, they're all just beautiful bottles. And that's why I see them as figures and even people. Um, so it's interesting when artists have materials that they utilize these common materials that everyone recognizes those materials. And it's a way to bring people in, an audience who might feel at times, uh, have told me that they felt intimidated about certain kinds of art materials that they didn't quite know what they were and therefore about how to talk about them. But when you use common materials, everyone's familiar with the materials uh, already. And so in the Nomad, I have washing machine windows. Um, mm -hmm. And That's when cool. I ask people, what are those round windows? They both have these extravagant ideas that they're things mm -hmm. like a submarine or something like that. But more than often, when I ask urban dwellers um, what those are, they immediately say they're laundromat washing machine fronts. And they recognize them because of their experience in using the laundromat. And so I, I feel that it's a great way uh, to both make art visible to those who are often considered invisible and the two become more visible in that encounter. Wow. I feel like that last statement about becoming more visible, you, you both are doing that and Narcy, so you do it by making these invisible workers very visible in your work. So thank you for that last um, statement, Dominique. That was such a great point um, that applies to both of you and, and your practice. Um, we might have time for one more question if it pops up. 
in the chat. Um, however, it feels like we're coming to um, a, a high point to maybe end the conversation. Um, I do see, uh, I'll read a comment from Alina, uh, having both of these gracious artists speak together in this edition was inspired. Uh, they both have so many valuable sensibilities and knowledge to share. Oh, thank you, Melina. I love reading that closing comment. And, um, you know, I want to thank Dominique and Narciso for being so candid and open in our discussion today. I thought it was very interesting. And even though I talked to both of you already, I still learned so much through this conversation. Um, I'd like to give each of you a, a chance to share with us uh, what you have coming up next and, and what's on the horizon for both of you. Uh, so we want to share uh, their social media and website. So you can uh, maybe uh, do a screen capture, take a photo. Um, we'll also try to put a link out there in the chat for you all. Um, but Dominique, is there anything you'd like to share or anything you have coming up? Um, not quite immediately. I, I actually am planning to got awarded the same week I was awarded coming into uh, Angel's Gate uh, and a, another residency um, at the at Arts at Blue Roof Studios. And so I'm excited to see how that unfolds this summer. Um, but I'm, I'm always uh, doing work and always encountering sometimes some surprise events. And so um, I don't do a lot of social media, but I am getting back into the swing of things. And so it's always good to just try and check in and see if anything is posted there. Wonderful. Well, I just want to brag for a moment and say Dominique is our newest uh, studio artist at Angel's Gate. So I'm spoiled that I'm going to be seeing you um, around campus. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and Narciso, uh, what do you have coming up? Uh, I, I'm going to be in a group show. It um, um, opens this Saturday, the 25th, at the Chich Center in Riverside. Uh, it's called uh, the, Land of, the Land of Milk and Honey, organized by the Mexicali Biennial, which is an organization that organizes shows in Mexico and along the U.S. border. Um, I'm also in a group show at Self Help Graphics, which also opens uh, this uh, Saturday, the 25th. Um, it's called Essential Workers uh, Visual Narrative. Um, so yeah, so I think that's, that's the two that I can think of right now. Wonderful. Well, we did put those links in the chat um, and we'll put up their websites real quick, if it, real quick if you want to grab that information. And of course, you can always email us if for some reason you, uh, you know, want to get this information later on. So at this time, I want to thank the artists again. Feel free to uh, turn off your webcams for a minute while we make some last um, announcements. And I also want to invite all of you to, to, to participate in some additional upcoming programs at Angels Gate Cultural Center. Uh, we're based in San Pedro, which is the very southern end of uh, Los Angeles City. And we have numerous free public events like this one. On April 15th, mark your calendars, Open Studios Day. Uh, of, all of our artists will open their studios. Well, most of them will open their studios. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Dominique is now part of our uh, uh, studio artist roster. Uh, that's gonna be from noon uh, to 4 p.m. on a Saturday, April 15th. And then we have some additional public programming coming up. Uh, we have an artist talk for the exhibition that you see uh, behind me in my virtual uh, uh, background. That's going to be in person in the gallery on March 4th. Uh, we're going to be having a closing reception for both galleries on March 25th. 
And then the same day as our Open Studios Day, we're also going to have two new exhibitions opening, uh, Notions of Place and Direct from the Classroom. Uh, if you want to sign up for our newsletter and get all the updates for all the events like this one um, and some of, some of the events listed on the screen, uh, go and sign up at our newsletter at angelsgateart.org. Follow us on social media. Angels Gate Art and Angels Gate Art Gallery uh, on Instagram. And then, of course, I'd like to thank um, the crew that makes this possible. Uh, she has been working in the background, but thank you, uh, Judith, who's our producer uh, and one of the initial uh, people behind this idea for this series, Studio Soup. So thank you, Judith. And then thank you uh, to Amy, who uh, read our questions in the chat and, and opened us for the evening. And then of course, thank you, Annie, who put all of these images uh, together and thoughtfully pulled them up throughout the conversation. And then um, a quick shout out to Adam Gaxiola, uh, another one of our studio artists, and that is our opening music and our uh, closing music. So thank you again, everyone for joining us tonight. All of these links, uh, that you saw on the screen. They're again in the webinar chat. Um, so thank you uh, for your time. And if you want to learn about the next Studio Soup, please uh, follow us, uh, visit our website, and uh, join us for the next one. So thank you everyone and have a great rest of your evening.